Carthage, the greatest enemy of Rome. Allegedly founded upon Queen Dido's escape to flee her murderous brother, this powerful city-state has undoubtedly made its mark on the history of the world. But apart from the myth being wrong, behind the stories of conquest, war, mythical love stories, are the lives of ordinary people. But what languages did they speak? Welcome to the Milu Project, and today we're going to be investigating the linguistic history of Carthage. Far away from Carthage, the very existence of the city arguably begins in the waters off the coast of modern day Lebanon with these guys, a variety of sea snails known as murex. Now I know you're wondering what on earth these snails have to do with a city over a thousand miles away, but hear me out. These snails produced a type of purple dye prized throughout the ancient world, and the trade of this, as well as cedar timber, led to the formation of numerous city-states, one of which being Tar. What's important to understand is that Tyre and the other Phoenician city-states, known for their maritime expertise, began to dominate the Mediterranean region. And around the time of the 8th to 9th centuries, Carthage was founded. You see, unlike the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, who used flat-bottom boats to traverse their rivers, the curved boats, which the Phoenicians pioneered, allowed them to traverse more easily the sea, enabling them to trade goods like copper, iron and olives, as well as cultural exports such as the alphabet and art, with civilizations across the Mediterranean. The thing about Carthage though, is that it wasn't just founded anywhere. The Tyrians strategically placed it on a triangular peninsula, looking out into the Gulf of Tunis with the lake of Tunis to its rear. The city was also positioned in a way which meant that it was close to the island of Sicily, which made it easier for the Carthaginians to control the narrow strait which lay between the continent and island. As the prosperity of the burgeoning city increased, this attracted many of the indigenous Berber people into Carthage. At the time, these Berbers were the spoken Numidian, which was descended from Proto-Berber. And their language used the Libico-Berber alphabet, a system indirectly inspired by the Phoenicians. Like most Afro-Asiatic languages, Numidian used a system of triconsonantal roots, where only consonants were written and vowels had to be inferred. This inscription here is how the Numidians would have written their language, transcribed into the Latin script for the sake of simplicity. And here is that same inscription with the vowels added. Numidian continued to be spoken until the 3rd century CE, until it developed into the various Berber languages, many of which are still spoken today. But back in the Levant, the Assyrians' invasion of Tyre prompted many of the city's nobles to emigrate to Carthage. On top of this, by the 6th century BCE, the Neo-Babylonians taking control of Tyre meant in many ways the severing of the relationship between Carthage and its mother city. It was around this time when the Carthaginians derived their own dialect of Phoenician, known as Punic. Over the next few centuries, Carthage thrived, conquering contiguous regions and maintaining both strong trade links and a large degree of self-sufficiency. And in terms of travel, just like their Phoenician forefathers, the Carthaginians were great navigators and it's known that they visited Britain, Ireland and even places as far off as Nigeria, Cameroon and Gabon. And militarily, Carthage moved from a citizen militia to 
to a force of mostly foreign mercenaries, a move which would later spell its downfall. But what was the Punic language like, and how did it differ from standard Phoenician? Punic initially was quite similar to standard Phoenician, and it's only really during the 5th century BCE when we start to see any signs of real divergence. In terms of phonology, Punic lost the pharyngeal sounds of Phoenician. B became allophonic with V, S moved to SH, and word initially, the Y sounds shifted to an E. Here's a chart of what Punic's phonology would have looked like. Punic scribes often hesitated to adopt more natural spellings for new words, and so for a long time, were reluctant to change the original Phoenician spellings. An example of this being the spelling of the indefinite article as ha, despite the fact that in Punic, this H ceased to be pronounced. But when it came to transcribing vowels, the Carthaginians had themselves a problem. The script they used was an abjad, which meant that it only showed consonants. To address this, the Carthaginians pretty much did nothing at least in the short term, because this system was actually pretty common amongst Afroasiatic languages of the time. Unlike the aforementioned Numidians, they used the system of triconsonantal routing. In terms of grammar, the language had two genders, masculine and feminine, three types of grammatical number, singular, dual and plural, as well as a distinction between the absolutes and the constructs. And with the verbs, the Carthaginians built the stems out of two or three consonants, adding vowels so that the verbs could be conjugated accordingly. Verbs could be conjugated in order to achieve the following tenses, moods and aspects. Although to be honest, this wasn't of huge importance, as the meaning of a verb was determined more by its position in the sentence than by actual morphology. The Carthaginians also introduced some grammatical innovations, such as the use of the verb yiktol at the beginning of sentences to indicate the past perfective. Although the verb yiktol existed in Phoenician, the past perfective was achieved through the use of the infinitive absolute. Here, are some examples of how Punic words evolved from Phoenician. And here is an example of some Punic text. This being a poem written in an iambic rhythm in the year 350 AD. In spite of the Roman invasion and subsequent colonization of the region, the use of Punic persisted for many centuries until the Arab conquest in the early 8th century. Anyway, that's all for this week. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe and tune in next week.